Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lois Harder, and I am the principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this, the second iteration of the Diversity and Diplomacy Speaker Series, um, entitled A Black Canadian Diplomat in the Southern US. Uh, I am hosting you today on behalf of my colleagues with the University of Alberta International and the Intersections of Gender Research Area. It is our university's practice to begin events such as this with a territorial acknowledgement. But of course, many of you are currently situated outside the bounds of Treaty 6 territory. I encourage you to reflect on your respective locations and the peoples who came before you who called that land home as I respectfully acknowledge the lands on which the University of Alberta is situated, traditional territory of Cree, Blackfoot, and Métis peoples, and many others. The idea for this series on diversity and diplomacy is the brainchild of my colleague Alex Kutsnetsov at University of Alberta International, and a wonderful collaboration with Christian gonzalez Pias, Danielle Scott, and Peter Carter, also of University of Alberta International, as well as Susanna Lumen and Rachel Zukuski from Intersections of Gender and my colleagues Shelby McLeod and Bailey Souza at the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. Today, of course, we are also extremely grateful to Consul General Nadia Theodore and her team at the Canadian Consulate for the Southeastern US, which is based in Atlanta. It has been a watershed summer for activism around racial inequality and injustice. George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis sparked global outrage, solidarity marches all over the world, calls for action, and sadly, backlash, and sadly, more police shootings, as we have seen just recently in the last two days in Wisconsin. Yet the momentum around anti-racism continues to build, even or maybe because of the difficulties for gathering that are posed by COVID. In this context, the conversation with Nadia Theodore, Canadian Consul General situated in the Southeastern US, presented itself as a golden opportunity. And we feel especially fortunate to have managed to coordinate this with Ms. Theodore's schedule as she is in fact leaving her post to return to Canada in a new role this autumn. But let me introduce Nadia Theodore to you properly. Nadia has served as Canada's Consul General to the Southeast United States since September 2017. Prior to her appointment, she served as Executive Director to Canada's Deputy Minister of International Trade at Canada's Permanent Mission to the World Trade Organization um, and, at Canada's, rather, and at Canada's Permanent Mission to the United Nations in Geneva. Over her career, she has built a reputation for forging strong partnerships with government and business leaders and building a strong multi and building strong multidisciplinary teams. Ms. Theodore has made advancing inclusion in the workplace a personal priority. She is committing, committed to making sure that the public service is included in the global conversation on building inclusive teams, including at senior levels. So I'm going to begin our webinar by uh, asking some prepared questions of Consul General Theodore. And then I will cede the moderating duties to my colleague, Susanna Lumen, who will be putting some of your questions in the audience to the Consul General. I know some folks submitted questions when you registered, but if anything occurs to you as this discussion unfolds, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to post your questions. So Nadia, thank you again so much for doing this for us. We really absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. So maybe we could just start off if you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to your work in in uh, diplomacy. How how you charted the, the course of your career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I like to say, I get asked this question a lot, as I'm sure many of you can imagine. And, you know, I like to say to folks, uh, A, because it, it's truthful, um, that I sort of fell into diplomacy. So um, I did my LLB, a law degree, realized I didn't want to be a lawyer and went back to do my master's in international relations with a focus on international trade in particular. 
and the role of international trade in building stronger economies across developing nations. Um, and when I finished that degree, I landed an internship um, at the Canada Revenue Agency doing legal work for them uh, using my, my legal degree. And when I was, uh, when I had the opportunity to become permanent in, in the federal public service, the position was at the Solicitor General's office uh, at the time that is now called Public Safety uh, Canada. And it was working with Indigenous, um, the, what was called at the time, the Aboriginal Policing Directorate. So it was all about negotiating um, what was supposed to be community-based policing uh, across Indigenous reserves um, in, in, in Canada. And, you know, that's, I suppose, where I got the feeling that negotiation might be something that I was interested in. Um, and I knew that I was interested in trade policy because that's what I did my, my degree on. And, you know, lo and behold, a, I, I had signed up, you know, signed up for the notifications of job posters and a job poster at Global Affairs Canada, what was back then called, um, what was it called? Foreign Affairs and International Trade Canada came up and I, and I applied. Um, and at the time, the way that these processes worked in the federal public service is that they graded everybody and gave you a mark. Everybody got a mark after your exam and your series of interviews. And the person who got the highest mark was ranked first and then, you know, so on. And you had to hire the person who came first, who ranked first, before you could then go to person number two and person number three and so on, assuming you only had one position. Now, you know, they create pools and then, you know, as long as you're qualified in a pool, you can, you can get pulled um, into a position. Well, I came number one. And not only did I come number one, but I was the only person that ranked in this process that was not already in the department, you know, on an internship or, or a term position or something. And so, you know, fast forward to even just, you know, three weeks ago when I was having a, an exit interview, one of my still mentors and the person who hired me when I first joined the department said to me, he said, you know, Nadia, I have to tell you. And he said, you know, he's told me the story many times, but we were just talking about it a few weeks ago. I have to tell you, we were all sitting around that table, that boardroom table thinking, who is this person? You know? <laughs> Who is this person who is not from the department, who we've never heard before, who we now have to hire because she came number one? <laughs> so, you know, I really did kind of fall into it. Um, and so, you know, I got hired and as the story goes, I, I, I had different um, roles that I, that I was lucky enough um, and that they were lucky enough to have me in at the department, all in trade policy and was sent to Geneva, Switzerland uh, to, to represent Canada at the World Trade Organization at our mission there, doing trade policy work, uh, came back and was Canada's deputy, one of two of Canada's deputy chief negotiators for the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. And then finally, when I landed the job as the chief of staff to our deputy minister, which is the head of the, the department um, on the trade side, uh, you know, she at the time, Christine Hogan, um, said to me, you know, you should think about going out as a head of mission. You know, that's something that I think you would be good at. It would be a different experience for you, not technical, because I'm a bit of a policy wonk, you know, not technical, but I think you'd be good at it. And so, you know, it took me a few years to, to wrap my head around that, but I, I so did. When the deputy suggests something to you, you, you take her up on it. <laughs> so, wow, that's, that's a fascinating story. That's, you know, how good that they were obliged to take you is the first step. Right? Yes, exactly. Well, it's true, though. It's true. And, you know, they laugh about it now, but it's true. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was very interesting to me that we had a, a consulate in the southeastern U.S. So, um, you know, I'm a Western Canadian, obviously. So perhaps could you tell us bit about uh, what Canada's interests are in, in the southeastern U.S. and what kind of work we do there, what the consul does there? 
Absolutely. So, I mean, historically, it has been uh, a consulate, an office that's focused on trade, right? So across the Southeast USA, Canada is the number one trading partner for those states. Um, you know, we have Canadian companies who are, um, who have offices here across the Southeast USA that employ, you know, tens of thousands of, you know, Georgians, Tennesseans, South Carolinians, you know, name the state. And so it is, has been historically a very heavily trade focused um, uh, a post. And especially as the Southeast becomes more known for music and film, many people know that Georgia is now, has now surpassed LA in terms of the film industry. Um, and, and, and FinTech is booming here in Georgia. There's a lot of opportunity, there are a lot of opportunities for Canadian businesses as well. And so the whole international business development team of the office um, is there to help Canadian companies that want to export their stuff um, to the Southeast USA to make connections and find those opportunities. But I'd have to say that, you know, over the past several years, and certainly in the three years that I have been here, I have really been focused, as, as have many of my predecessors over the past several years, really focused on really looking at the Southeast USA and the socioeconomic and political climate, um, small p political climate, um, and looking at what we can learn from the temperature mm -hmm. and the trajectory of this region of the world back home in Canada. Because part of what diplomacy is, and part of the reason why we have offices, whether it's a consulate general or an embassy or a high commission abroad, absolutely it's to help business relations. Absolutely it's to provide consular services, so to help Canadians in distress when they're traveling. But you know, another part of it is really this idea that through diplomacy, through deepening relations with two, countries or regions across countries, we can really learn the best and, and the not so best, right? And the worst of what is happening in a region of the world in order to apply it back home for better or for worse, right? That is also part of the, the beauty of diplomacy in my view. And I think that, um, you know, the movement that's been happening across the Southeast USA over the past 20 years in terms of growing their economy, in terms of inclusive growth, in terms of the rise of cities and the importance of cities is, is something that is of great interest to me. And so I've been doing a lot of internal thinking um, and the work of the consulate has moved towards really showcasing Canadian culture, the brand that is Canada across the Southeast to see where those synergies are. So, I, so I'm totally intrigued by that answer. Um, what would you say that you have learned in your time as Consul General about, about the dynamics of politics and maybe race politics in the Southeast US that, that would be helpful for Canadians to know about? You know, I would say that my number one takeaway that I would hope that in Canada we would embrace is that if you are not careful and if you are not intentional and if you are not committed to being uncomfortable, the issues around race relations and equity and inclusion can really creep up um, and creep up and become so incredibly intense and so incredibly permeating across all aspects of society that it really becomes, for many, especially for people who don't look like me, because for people that look like me, I mean, this is not new, um, but for people that don't look like me, if you're not careful, 
it really does creep up and it, and it be, can become, it can permeate across everything to a point where the work that needs to be done to get you to a place that is okay um, is, is really significant. And, 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 I, and, I, and I say that because I think that in Canada, we are very much at risk given our um, sort of niceness over anything. In Minnesota, they call it Minnesota nice. Um, I don't know, we need to think of like a fun saying for Canada, but you know, the niceness of Canada. And frankly, you know, our desire to peg ourselves against the United States in a way that always sees us as the nicer, um, more progressive, more left of center, um, even 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 at the right side of the of the spectrum of the political spectrum, right? Um, I think that that can be a disservice to us because I think that that can very easily turn into um, an unwillingness to unpack some of the very important issues across various aspects of our society. Um, that is very necessary, and and if left too long, can really can really get out of control. Right. Uh, so, well, okay. So a million questions. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm really interested in the way what I, what I would characterize as a kind of racial innocence in Canada. I mean, racial innocence, of course, is not unique to, to Canadians by any stretch. But I do think vis-a-vis -vis America and the, and the point that you just observed, that there is this kind of sense that, oh, well, things happen in the US and, and race relations aren't like that in Canada. So I'd, I'd be very interested and obviously caution, you're, you're urging caution, and I think that's right. Um, that is, we should be attuned to this. Uh, and and these conversations really do need to happen, not but not with caution, right? With with real courage, um, and and a real willingness to make some mistakes. Because of course, when you that certainly when white folks start to broach this, they tend to make a lot of mistakes, and uh, and so you know I. I Discuss, I guess is what Yeah, you're... no, you know, listen, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I, and I think that, you know, I, I think that part of, so, so, so two things, big picture, absolutely. I think that like, we, like you said, like I said, we need to be courageous. We need to be okay with being uncomfortable. Yes, you need to be okay with making mistakes, but more importantly, okay with making mistakes with a view to learning from the mistakes, right? So I was talking to a friend of mine, um, a middle-aged white man um, who was a dear friend. And, you know, he said to me, you know, Nadia, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of saying something wrong. I'm terrified of this cancel culture. I'm terrified for my boys. He's got two young boys. Terrified for my boy who are also white uh, males. Um, terrify for my boys that they're going to say something and, you know, all of a sudden this cancel culture, it's like you say something wrong and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're canceled. And I said to him, you know, and I thought about it for a while after and I said, R really though? I mean, I think what happens is that people make mistakes and A, nobody has the courage to tell them about it. People make little mistakes, right? An aggression in the office, um, a, a bias that shows up um, between, bet between a subordinate and somebody with, with power. We can talk about bias and what that really means and why it really matters and why, when it doesn't really matter. Um, and all of these things, to me, go on, on unsaid and unpacked until one day that person says something one too many times in the wrong forum on you know on twitter on whatever but i have yet to really see um a situation where it really is the very first time that anybody's ever said anything inappropriate and all of a sudden you know they're canceled 
Um, there, there, I have yet to see it, maybe others, others um, have, but more often than not, and I would hazard to say every single solitary time, um, it really is an accumulation of, of times and instances where a person either was not um, uh, corrected or didn't listen, right? Was not, was not willing to really listen to the advice or the subtle cues um, that may have been given to them um, by those around them. So yeah, absolute courage and, and a willingness to be uncomfortable, but, but more importantly, a willingness to really sit down and learn and think, right? Um, when you are challenged. So you're, you're leading a mission. You are, as I understand it, only the second black woman to lead a Canadian mission abroad. Um, and obviously you're very committed to building diverse teams. So could you tell us a little bit, I mean, are those the conversations that you have with your teams? How, how do you manage to, you know, deal with people's discomfort and those, those kinds of questions and encourage people to be courageous? Yeah, you know, I will admit um, and be very transparent that it is very hard for me, I find, um, to have those conversations, those very honest conversations with members of my team. Um, and I have found that not everybody is in the same place, right? Um, clearly. Um, and, um, and oftentimes what I need to balance, and I think that especially being a representative of your country abroad, oftentimes what you need to balance is conserving your energy for the job that it is that, that you are there to do, um, which is already a, a, a very big job and takes a lot of um, mental and emotional energy in and of itself. Balancing that with the energy of wanting or feeling the need to be the teacher and the learner um, and the person who brings people along and brings people to the table. Um, and so what I have tried to do is really to equip people with the tools that are necessary um, in order to figure those questions out for themselves, frankly, right? Um, I know people probably that are listening have heard this a lot over the past several months, in fact, but, you know, and I firmly believe this, and it might, you know, be an unpopular opinion, um, but issues around equity and racism is actually not a me problem. Um, it's not a people person, people that look like me problem, in fact. I'm happy to help, um, but I am not the one that has to do the work, really, at the end of the day, right? Uh, and I think that we need to be just as honest as we are about that fact when it comes to race as we are with anything else, right? In a normal sort of work relationship, say, um, when you're a supervisor and you have a, 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 um, somebody that you're supervising that you're supposed to be training, you know, you give them the tools and then you're like, now it's up to you. Like, now you have to sort of learn the craft. You need to show your stuff, you need to, you know, do the work, talk to your colleagues, figure it out and, you know, develop in your, in your career, right? And I'm here to help you along, but you have to do the work. Um, and it's the same thing. Um, and so, yeah, and so I, I have found that a balance for me is very important. Um, myself and my colleague, the Consul General of Los Angeles, Zave Sheikh, we are the co-leads on this initiative that we're doing across the North American network. And um, it's really about developing a program to make our missions across North America um, anti-racist workplaces um, and, in, and incorporate um, the, the principles of equity and inclusion in across all programs that, that we are engaged in, whether it's the International Business Development Program, whether it's the Foreign Policy and Diplomacy Program, whether it's about internal HR and hiring. So we're developing that program. And I feel like that is going to be, as I transition out of the diplomatic service in a few weeks, um, it will be, that will be my legacy, um, hopefully, uh, with, with regards to sort of um, 
building the institutional wherewithal across within my mission and across the network. That sounds like such an important initiative. It's um, in a way, it's too bad that that's happening in 2020, right? That this, yes. But anyway, we'll take it, where, right? Yeah. <laughs> we will take it where when we get it exactly. <laughs> so um, that, that question, I guess, about you know race in Canada versus race in the U.S. and your your particular view on that from where you've been located since 2017, could you? Could you offer us some, some reflections on, on what it means to be Black in Canada versus what it means in your experience there? Yeah, you know, I would say, well, first I would say that the complexity of being a Black female either in the United States or in Canada cannot be underestimated, right? So I live but one experience. Um, and really and truly, I believe that when we are talking about building anti-racist institutions um, and really moving towards an anti-racist society, it's really important um, to only use personal experiences insofar as um, they might help with developing empathy across people, right? But really and truly, and I know this has now become kind of a buzzword or a buzz saying, you know, racism is not an actual, it's not an event, right? It's not about my personal experience or your personal experience or somebody else's personal experience. It really is an institution, right? It really is about how we have set up our societies, we have set up our place settings across all of our institutions in a way that prioritizes and centers a certain type of person, um, which has been white, middle-class males, right? That we, we have set up our place settings that way. And, and because of that, um, we have created institutions that are not equipped really to distribute power across everybody in society, right? People that look like me, people that look like you, women, um, whether they be white women or women, racialized women, and especially not racialized women, and especially not indigenous women or black women. Um, and I think that that's important. So having said that though, I have to say, that over the past three years in the United States, I have never felt more, I have never felt more than I have ever before that I am a black female. I feel that more here in the United States. And I have to say that I have never felt better about it <laughs> than I have um, ever before being here in the United States and in Atlanta in particular, right? I feel a very, um, a sense of freedom here in Atlanta and in across the United States, I think, because the conversation, even though there is a long way to go, quite clearly, um, the conversation around race is much more open and advanced in the United States than it is in Canada. Um, and the examples of black excellence um, are, are significant here, right? Um, and, it, and it hit, and people might hear that and think, well, you know, it's because, you know, there's, okay, that's great that there's more black excellence in, in Atlanta than, or in, in the US than there is in Canada, but I'm careful with my language, right? It's not that there is more black excellence here than there is in Canada. It is the recognition and the ability to rise to your excellence here. Um, that as we have seen over the past several months as people in media, across government, across corporate Canada have risen up and, and said, um, you know, we are here. Why are, why are we not here? <laughs> um, 
so yeah, so it has been it has been a complicated experience. But then, you know, at the same time, I, I do have to say that, you know, here in the States, absolutely when my husband goes out late at night um and you know is 45 minutes late getting home, I worry in a way that I did not that I don't worry in Canada. That is true. Is that true? Yes, that is very true. Um, so it's complicated, right? It's it's complicated and and intertwined with many different personal reflections, personal feelings, personal experiences. Um, and I think that no one one person's experience is the same, but certainly mine has been um, quite positive in many ways, and especially professionally. Um, yeah, especially professionally. Yeah, I can I can see that. You know, my my students often tell me stories. My students often tell me stories about how they're often asked, "No, but where are you really from?" Right? Where, yes. Where, right. And uh, there there is a way in which that doesn't happen for Black folks in the U.S. The, in the way that it does in Canada. So I think those differences, um, again, on the racial innocence part, Canada has a way has a ways to go. I think. On Indeed. Of, yeah. All right, well, I um, will cede the ground now to my colleague Susanna and to the, the questions of the group and, and um, I'll, I'll come back in uh, at the end of the Q&A. So thanks so much. Okay, Nadia. great, excellent, thank, thank you. Thank you, Lois, and thank you, Nadia. I really want to acknowledge um, how grateful we, I think, all are that you're willing to speak so directly to, you know, difficult questions of race and racism and your personal experience. And it's a bit of an odd situation, right? So we have two white women, you know, interviewing a, a black woman, which also speaks to the kind of institutional situation um, in Canada, right? <laughs> that faculty members in Canadian universities are still overwhelmingly, I mean, we have a very small black minority in, in, at the University of Alberta. So I want to acknowledge that and I, I really want to appreciate your willingness and openness and, and really careful thinking that helps us to, to think further. We have a lot of questions from the audience, so I'm going to pick okay. a couple of ones to move um, to slightly different topics. Okay. So one, one question that um, uh, one of the attendants asked is, the difference between diplomacy efforts um, of Canadian uh, in Canada between Indigenous peoples at the Crown and kind of participation of Indigenous people in the US in the US government. So um, when you talk about trade and economic relations, um, what is your experience or role with um, when it comes to Indigenous people in the in the US, for example? the Seminole people in Florida, you know, are they part of the diplomatic effort? Um, can you, I mean, it's yeah, a broad question, so, but. Yeah, that's a, so that's an interesting question, you know, and I have to say um, that over the past three years that I've been here, I have tried to do better um, or, may, or differently at least with regard to how we, we being um, those who call ourselves Canadians and the diplomatic service, how we incorporate this idea of indigenous peoples who live in Canada into our diplomatic and foreign policy and diplomacy um, programming. And I have to say that, you know, a part of me has felt quite uncomfortable with it because understanding that we have a long way to go back home, um, appreciating, personally, appreciating the idea that at least our governments have been um, vocal in, 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 in saying that we have a long way to go, which for a diplomat, somebody representing their country, at least that is something that I feel comfortable saying, right? So whenever I, um, you know, for Canada Day, we hired uh, an, an Indigenous artist uh, who happens to live in Tennessee, um, but, but grew up in, in, in Canada, born and raised in Canada, in fact. Um, and and um, she has this fantastic song all around, um, um, murdered and missing Indigenous women. She, she's, she's Indigenous herself. And when I was introducing her for a Canada Day event, at least I could say that, you know, I am presenting you with this Indigenous artist as a celebration of a piece of Indigenous culture 
but recognizing that the real work is about economic and social empowerment of Indigenous peoples across Canada, and we have a long way to go. And I can say that because mm -hmm. my Prime Minister has said it, governments have said it, you know, whether we're doing enough to get a, to, to, to move forward is, is a different question and, and, and very complicated, but, but at least I can say that. And so that has been um, um, selfishly helpful for me. Um, and what I've also done is, you know, not been afraid, going back to what we were talking about before, to really ask the questions and seek out the help, right? So um, I had the opportunity to meet a wonderful woman, Larissa Crawford, who is a Black Indigenous woman um, living in Canada, who connected me with some material on um, Indigenous communities in Canada and in the United States and the intersection between the two. And so we were able to hold a few events that connected different communities to talk about what, um, what promoting, promoting Indigenous culture mm -hmm. in diplomacy really can mean across the two borders, which has been very interesting. And Larissa and, and, and her organization called Future Ancestors is going to be part of, of this program that I'm, that I'm curating for the next 12 months for all of our missions abroad so that we can do it in a more appropriate way and in a way that really is geared towards having people, A, understand the history, actually know the history, so know what you're celebrating, um, know whether you should be celebrating it or not, um, understand what you might be able to do across borders um, to further whatever action plans that the communities themselves might, might, be, might, might be interested in, um, because to me, that's what furthers real understanding, right? Good. Which is what diplomacy is supposed to be. Um, and so it, it has been an uneven experience for me. Um, and I wish, you know, I wish I had another three years so that I could get even better at it. But I, but I do think that the office here in Atlanta in particular uh, has made strides in that regard with, with the help of people like Melissa Crawford. Um, and, I, and I hope that we only get better. Great, thank you. Yes, because of course one cannot help notice that sometimes um, the Canadian um, approach to um, Indigenous culture is decorative, right? I mean, I remember going to the, the Canadian Embassy in Berlin, which is beautiful, and it has a ton of beautiful Indigenous art in there, which I think is important, but I think what you really speak to is the meaningful diplomatic relationships and, the, and recognizing, of course, the history of relations between Indigenous people that are not, that are not you know, they don't end at the border. <laughs> <laughs> communities well, exactly. have relationships across, you know, they're, they're, the communities and, and nations have been cut up by, by national borders, right? So exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and also, you know, bringing those voices, bringing them, you know, finding ways to make space, to remove, to, 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 to make space for those voices to be part of the diplomatic conversations, okay. like, you know, at a certain point, it becomes imperative for me in the world of diplomacy and in the world of international relations to stop to stop talking about something <laughs> um, and to start listening to the people talk about it as we listen, <laughs> right? The, pe yeah. the, the, the subject matter that we are interested in to actually be sitting on the sidelines while they are around the table talking and we are listening in order to inform um, how we are all going to move forward together. And to me, that's where the future of diplomacy really is, right? right? Um, very, I mean, very interesting. I, I wish we had more time. I mean, with all I these know. questions, I wish we had more time. I'm going to ask a couple of other questions if we can get them in kind of all okay. over the map. One is about diplomacy under COVID. <laughs> Ah, right. So on yes. the one hand, we see the kind of politicization um, in in the U.S., but also here in Canada around what public health measures are: mask wearing, social distancing. You know, does the state have a right to mandate this? But how does this play out in diplomacy? I mean, really, the the very maybe banal question, but that is more behind that, of course. What does it look like to do diplomacy with mask or without mask um, as you encounter the many different political positions around this in your current post? Can you speak to that? Yes. 
Well, listen, so I will give you uh, the diplomatic answer and then I'll tell you what I really think. Um, I, you know, luck, lucky for me, it is really not my place to tell another country what they are or are not supposed to do, right, in their own country. I'm, I'm a visitor here. Um, I'm, I'm a visitor here. They have invited me into their, into their country very graciously um, to promote understanding and cooperation between the Southeast USA and Canada. Um, and, and that is why I'm here. Uh, I, I'm not here to tell them um, how, 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 to, how, to, how to run things, right? Um, however, having said that, and here's what I really think, um, you know, I, especially when you're talking about the health and safety of yourself, your people in your office and their families, I have really taken the view during COVID that my number one concern among, before anything else, even before, you know, a, the diplomatic relationship between Canada and whatever state through an interaction with two people, myself and, you know, whomever, even before that, my concern is the health and safety of my people and their families. Um, and so I have just decided that that is what is going to be predominant for me. Um, and so we, um, if we, we have decided, or I have decided, I suppose, um, as an office that, um, you know, we are going to move in lockstep with many multinational corporations around the world and use all of the wonderful virtual tools that are not perfect, but nor were face-to-face -face interactions, I will remind people, um, to do the work of, 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 of diplomacy for the next little while. And where we cannot, because there are times when we cannot, right? Where there are times when things are sensitive and, and, and security laden and, and you cannot, uh, we will wear masks. And I have to say that and this goes kind of to a broader, um, uh, a broader statement around international relations and diplomacy and branding your country. Mm -hmm. When you decide what the value is, what, what your value is, what your most important value is, in my case, I have decided that it is health and safety. When you decide that and you decide to stand in that truth, of what you are going to value most, it becomes quite easy, right? Mm -hmm. um, it becomes quite easy to lead with that value um, because you've made the decision and you've realized that will it create awkward moments when somebody invites you to a big gala dinner and you have to say no, indeed. But you have decided to lead with your values. Um, and you have decided what the hierarchy of your values, values is. And so it makes it much easier, I find. I found it was very hard at the beginning when I hadn't yet, or actually not in the beginning, because in the beginning it was easy because we didn't know what it was and everybody was kind of like, oh my goodness, right? It's that middle part where kind of started to get tricky. <laughs> um, and I hadn't yet decided, you know, should I be balancing? Should I be trying to juggle? Should I be trying to make... And I, when I decided, nope, it's health and safety. It's the health and safety of my people, of their team, of their families, of the team, that is going to be foremost that it got quite easy for me. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I, I have to say, I feel like I'm taking a lesson from what you just said, um, because what you really emphasize for me is the kind of how do how you how are you, how you take up a leadership position, which is you know that your values really need to you know they need to come through, even if there's controversy or resistance to that but I think you really have emphasized for me today and I will take that with me this um, you know to really think about in, in kind of complex situations what are the values and to lead with those values and to be quite clear about them so I really appreciate that I feel like I will take that with me absolutely um, so another kind of pivoting which is our favorite word at the moment right? We're pivoting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so let's pivot to another question so we have a number of students on this, um, we know, on this event. Um, and so 
the students are always interested in what does it take to develop a career in inter international diplomacy. Can you give us some insight on what would be a solid preparation? And I know you fell into this, um, yeah. but you clearly had, uh, you know, a preparation, even if it wasn't planned, but something that helped you um, uh, to, to be successful in this um, diplomatic roles, in many roles that you've taken on. So what are the opportunities for people with degrees, for example, in science and engineering? Are there certain degrees that are more um, valued? Can you speak a little bit to, to advice you would give to students? Yeah, my advice would be to do whatever degree that you love. There is no val degree that is most valued. Um, in fact, now there's a lot of discussion about the, the need to have people that have strong science backgrounds, right? This idea of health diplomacy is starting to gain a little bit of traction, um, of course, given, given where we are today. So uh, we, and we have people in the service that are engineers, that have, that studied medicine, that did, you know, history, languages, um, law, political science, um, you, you name the degree, uh, and we have people that, that, that are in the diplomatic service. And I don't think that there is a one degree that is more valued than another. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to answer this question a little bit differently though, because, you know, beyond what degree you should take and, you know, um, what entry level job you should get and, you know, how to work your way up, you know, the number one advice that I would give to students, um, especially uh, if there are racialized students mm -hmm. listening, um, and I know you hear this a lot, but I want you to really think about what it means and sit with it. Um, know your worth, you know, really study your craft and understand that when opportunities come to you, they are coming to you because you are qualified for them. <laughs> and they are coming to you because unfortunately, it might have taken a long time for those who hold the power in institutions to realize that you were qualified, but they aren't coming to you because of something somebody else did, right? You did it. You are the gift. You are the talent. You are the knowledge source. Um, and I say that because, you know, now there's a lot of talk around hiring more people, uh, racialized people, people of color, um, black and, and indigenous people. Um, and, you know, I, and I felt it myself, actually, I, you know, I'll be, I'll be completely transparent. Sometimes there's a little bit of people wanting to make you feel like they are giving you an opportunity, right? Like they are champion, championing you. And we say that a lot, find yourself a champion, find yourself a, a sponsor. Absolutely, you do need sponsors and champions. But just remember that those people are championing, championing you and sponsoring you because you are the gift. <laughs> you are the knowledge base. You are bringing the stuff, right? And I think that if we're not careful, we will end up in a place where especially I, I think young, younger people who don't have maybe perhaps as much experience and, and are still trying to find their footing, they will forget that, um, that you need to be humble, yes, absolutely, but you also need to know your worth. And you also need to remember that nobody does you any favors actually, that, 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 that you are really the gift. Um, I think that that is going to be ever more important now um, um, as people look to, to diversify their workspaces. Um, and I use the quotations on purpose. Um, so that, that would be the one piece of advice that I would give to people. Learn your craft, get really good at what you do and be confident in that once you have done that. 
And then yes, find those people because you know the, 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 the truth of the matter is for racialized people across Canada that more often than not, it is going to be people that don't look like you who are going to hold the power and who are going to be the, the ones who have to bring you into their organization. Um, but never forget that you, that, that, that you hold the gift um, and that the excellence lies in you and not in somebody, something that somebody's giving to you as, as a favor or because they're championing you um, or, or sponsoring you. I think that is a beautiful last word to, to take, for us to take with, um, really to remember you are the gift for um, um, racialized uh, uh, folks um, or for members of equity seeking groups. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, just as a one last comment, um, I read an article today that asked whether Krista Freeland is actually encountering the same right now, whether she is actually qualified, right? Because well, she's the, the first thing. woman. Yeah, same thing. So, so you are the gift. I, I really want to, to end on that note. Thank you so much, um, General Concho, um Theodora. It was a real pleasure to speak with you today. Um, we wish you all the very, very best for Thank the last you. few weeks in Atlanta Thank and you. then the transition back to Canada. Um, I don't know, Lois, if you want to, to say some last words. Well, I'll certainly add my thanks. I, I do feel like this has been an incredible gift and we really appreciate your willingness to be so forthcoming and uh, a really, really enriching conversation. So really very grateful um, that Thank you were here us when I, I know you've got lots on the go and you are off to something quite quickly. Um, <laughs> so I do just want to say thank you to you, Nadia, to uh, the organizing team and of course to the audience for participating. If folks in the audience are interested in sharing this with people who couldn't participate today, there will be a transcript of the recording of this event available um, in about two weeks time or so on the various websites of the organizations that, that hope um, so I will just say thank you, and thank you again, Nadia, and we wish you all the best in what comes next, and certainly in this great project that you're you're embarking on around equity and diversity in the in public service. Thank you, and I'm sorry I'm seeing all these questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to any of them. We'll have to do we'll have to do like an IG or something, an, I, an IG live or something for all these questions. I, I'm because some of them are very very good. Anyway, what my role new role is back in Canada. I'm leaving the diplomatic service and I'm, I'm going to work for Maple Leaf Foods. Um, Sharon asked that question. Anyway, thank you to everybody. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Um, thank you, Susanna and, and um, Lois for, for having me. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.